So anyway, we're, we're in 1 Corinthians. So this whole topic of the resurrection of the body, 1 Corinthians 15 is like the resurrection chapter of Jesus as well as the believers. And, and so uh, uh, I'm not really in text there. I'm kind of look, using a lot of scriptures. And I'm looking at the question, is the human body eternal? I asked the question, I said, if you think the human body is eternal in my class of about 40, and I said, raise your hand, and if you, and if you don't think the body is eternal, keep it down, and, and only two people knew. Of course, it's kind of a trick question, because when you ask that, your first, quest, your first thing you come into your mind is, does, does the body get, you know, put in the grave? And it does, but your body is regenerating constantly, like it, it's dying, like everything on my body right now, everything about me wasn't here a few years ago because I've been constantly regenerating. And you know, there's a scripture that talks about unless a, a grain of wheat fall and bear, go into the ground and die, then it can't r- right, raise up. And, and there's, something, there's something about that though, in a, a grain of seed, it, uh, there's, there's a measure of life in it always. And our, our, our soul and our spirit, we know it doesn't die. And our body, as it were, on earth is dead. But when we raise again, it is. It's not like God took some brand new body, but we call it DNA. Do you understand that? There's a DNA that God resurrects and puts the new regenerated body in us. And so, I, if, you know... <laughs> Uh, I listened to several people uh, on this topic, and I, 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 I believe I'm right on it. The, the, but the point being that when I get to heaven, this body is going to be perfect, and it's going to be this body with this DNA in heaven. How many know what I'm saying? Because there's only one of me, and aren't you glad? And, and, and so this old body, you know, Pastor Hawkins, you should have made everybody sit and listen to that song. So since you didn't, I'll sing it. Ain't no gray gonna hold my body down ain't no gray my dad's brother Dewey he came when I went to see him the last time I was with all of my cousins his his kids he's got he's got five kids we were all there together and about a year before he passed and and he broke out into that that's his song and he would sing in church he was a, a kind of a deacon slash pastor and he broke out sitting there in his chair so he's got Alzheimer's. He can't remember a lot of things, but he remembered every word because there's verses to that. He sang that whole thing. It's just incredible. I got it, I got it on a video. And what an inspiration. One of my favorite songs. And one of these punk, punk new f- funky groups are out, they got that song and re-recorded it. And they think it's a cool popular song, but it's really an antique old geezer song. And they're being fooled by it. And everybody, all the young people think, ooh, cool new song. No, it's been around like since the 30s or something like that. So um, it's a great song, though, isn't it? So, Well, the resurrection of the human body from the grave is clearly taught in Scripture, in God's Word. Job, and if you look at Job 19, 25, and 26, one of the oldest patriarchs, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh... I will see God. That's plain as can be in my flesh. So this old body is my flesh, folks. And it's evident that Job was firm in his belief in the resurrection of his body and a future life beyond the grave. Abraham, the founder and father of his race, in Genesis 25, 7 and, seven and 8, it says this, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last, last and died at a good old age an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. And then it goes on in Hebrews 11.10, talking of, of, uh, of, uh, of Abraham, and it says, for he was looking forward, this is speaking of Abraham, to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And then if you pick up at 11.16, it says, instead they were longing for a better country because Abraham wasn't worried about this world and this home. He was looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then in verse 19, it says, and Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. 
I'm going to tell you that there is a resurrection of the dead, and there is, and we have that hope. And my mom, this 2019, I can look at it through negative lens or positive lens, and I can look at this year as being a horrible year because my mom's going to die here in the next a month or two and maybe days, I don't know for sure. But I can look at that, she's dying, or I can look at that she's been praying, God, I don't want to suffer anymore. I'm okay. If me suffering means I can win more and more people, the person to Jesus, she told me this, then I will suffer in my body because she hurt a lot. She said, but if I'm, when I'm done, I'd like to get out of here because I'm ready to meet the Lord. Why doesn't the Lord just take me? So I can look at it like, you know what? She's no longer in pain. She's gone. She's, gonna, she's with the Lord, and, and that's a positive thing. I can look at other things that have happened that are negative, or I can think about how I, I inherited the greatest son-in-law in the universe uh, when my daughter married him up about a, about a month ago tomorrow. And uh, I, I think he's, he was tailor-made. My daughter's name is Taylor, in case you don't know. And uh, I, I really believe that. In Psalm, the psalmist said in Psalm 16, 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secu secure. Uh, in, in, uh, in Psalm number 17, 15, it says that as for me, I will, I will be vindicated and will see your face when I awake. I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. In heaven, we're going to have eyes. We're going to have physical bodies. We're going to be able to hear. We're going to be able to speak. We're going to be known as we are known. It's, it's a real deal. Our bodies are there. And uh, so the body that is raised from the dead is indeed, and it's not just a soul or a spirit. And, and uh, someone said on my Facebook about my mother that, that she's going to make a great angel. Well, she's not going to become an angel. Angel aren't, angels aren't dead people. Angels are created beings. People, people go and they're, 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 you know, with the Lord and, and, and receive the reward. And there's no more struggle of sin and no more struggle of flesh and no more sickness and death and dying and pain and sorrow. That's, that's heaven. So when our, Jesus, when our Lord Jesus was on earth, he taught that all men who die will be raised again at some future day, date. All men. He said, look at John 5, 28 and 29. It says this, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good and rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Both the righteous and the re there's resurrection point one of the righteous, of the just, and of the just, unjust. All people will raise up. And uh, uh, we believe in the resurrection of human, the human body from death and from the grave. And as Pastor Hawkins said, without this belief, our hope and our preaching, our life, our faith is vain. And if it's false, then Christ is the world's biggest imposter. So be clear that the Bible speaks clear on this, of the subject of the resurrection. There's no confusion or doubt about it. Now, many people have a wrong conception have been taught to believe that there's only one general, one resurrection of all the dead at the end of the world. This is a serious error. It's an error. And uh, make sure I didn't skip any verses here that I wanted to put in there. This is a serious error which robbed many believers of joy and victory. Nowhere in scriptures are we taught that the bodies of all men will be raised at the same time. It is true that all the dead will be raised and brought into judgment, but neither the time, place, nor the judgments are the same. The Bible clearly distinguishes between a first and a second resurrection. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice, John 5, 28, 29 says. All, those that are evil and those that have done good. We just read it. And so... When men are raised, not all will be raised at the same time, nor in the same condition. There's two resurrections for two classes of men. One will be raised to immortal, eternal life, while the other will be raised to condemnation and banishment from the presence of God forever. And there is a resurrection of life, and there is a resurrection of damnation. Sad to say. It's not God's will that any perish, obviously. In Luke 14, 14, we read, and you will be blessed, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There it is. 
There is a blessing and a reward and a payment and God's blessing on the righteous that are resurrected. And since the dead in Christ shall rise first, the implication, the dead that are not in Christ will rise later. Remember all those scriptures. The, then the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and caught up will, will remain, will, will be caught up with the Lord secondly after that. So that's at the, the rapture time. Uh, Luke makes no mention in this passage about a resurrection of the unsaved. Instead, the unsaved will be raised, though, but not there not for a considerable length of time. In Acts 24, 15, we see both of them mentioned in one verse. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Two different resurrections. And, uh, and so uh, that, that's easy and, and it's plain to see. Uh, if, you, if you go back to and, and check out... Uh, uh, at, uh, Matthew 27, 51 to 52, you'll see the, the righteous, the just resurrection. The second point is, is that believer's resurrection is in three stages. The believer's resurrection is in three stages. Matthew 27, 51 to 52 speaks of, of one of them, and it says this, at the moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, the earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. This is at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of the prophets at that time when Jesus rose from the dead also rose. And we see, we read on that people uh, notified and knew and saw these people that were dead alive. And then they were taken up into heaven. So one of the things that took place, the believer's resurrection, uh, it, 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 there, there was a, th this happening, and it was uh, like a, a first fruits, and I will talk about that in a minute. And then in First Thessalonians, at the catching away, we see, we have this word, it's not a biblical word, but it's a word we use, just like we use the word Trinity, that's not a biblical word that describes what the Bible teaches about God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have this word rapture, and it, it basically just is, uh, this verse is being caught up caught away is what it is and it says in first thessalonians 4 16 for the lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of god and the dead in christ will rise first so there is this resurrection that is a foreshadowing of all who have their hope in christ that happened when jesus rose and jesus being the first fruits of all that have risen and then we have the moment when we believe in the last days, when there'll be a trumpet sound and a shout of God and people will raise up out of the grave. And I'll tell you, with the way the world is, when you read old, when you read uh, end time events and the signs of the end times, uh, you know, we're in them as much as we've ever been, if not more. So just lift up your head, you know, and I'm not, I'm not one of these people that's going to like say 88 reasons why he's coming in 88 and then when I'm wrong say 89 reasons why he's coming in 89 and I'm sure you're not going to say 2019 reasons why he's going to come before 2019 is up I don't know but I know he's coming he's going to come for sure and there is going to this is going to happen in Corinthians it mentions it as well in 1 Corinthians 15 52 it says this in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That's the believers. This is the believer's resurrection in three stages. You have the stage of projecting. When Christ rose, he was of the first fruits for all, and then those that rose with him. Then you have the rapture time, and now we have a time at the end of time, those that were martyred, those that were results of the 144,000 Jews that went forth preaching the gospel, that during the seven years of great tribulation, many will not take the mark of the beast. They didn't know and mark it clear. If you've been offered the gospel and you rejected it and you're here, you'll be deceived. You won't be one of these. Paul makes it clear in Thessalonians that he will, God himself will bring delusion so that whole message that you've heard preached, what to do if you miss the rapture, point one, two, three, forget it. If you've learned that message, you know about Jesus, you can forget it if you miss the rapture. You don't have another chance. You're done. This is for people that have never heard. This is mainly for the Jewish nation. These people are going to be saved. And the Bible declares that after that seven-year period, there's going to be a resurrection of 
of, of, of those that were martyred. There were martyrs. They're going to rise up. And so there's another stage. And look at it, Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5. It says, I saw thrones on which we were seated, those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads. People that came to Christ during the seven-year Great Tribulation, it's pointing to that. So we got three phases of the believer's resurrection physical body that are going to be in heaven, and you see it pictured there. How many of you ever heard that taught? Two in, there's a few people. There's a few people, and I want to commend the one that I knew would know, and Cleo knows everything, and she's a theological genius. I knew she would know this. So uh, thank you, Cleo. And uh, so the next point, after the, there's the resurrection of the just and the unjust, secondly, there's the believer's resurrection in three stages. And then, as I mentioned in Matthew 27, Christ being of the first fruits, I want to talk about that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23, it says... Uh, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, meaning they physically died from earth, but they're not really dead. They call it asleep in Jesus, right? For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, the Lord said to Moses. That's it. So it's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23, and we see that there is this, there is this first fruits. Christ is risen from the dead and becomes the first fruits of them that slept. For since by Adam came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's what he's saying. For as in Adam all have died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So he's the first of the resurrected ones. He's the first to be made alive. He's the first to point to the hope that is ours, the sure hope, the blessed hope, the confident hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and of eternal life. But every man in his own order, it says, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. So the word first fruits is a significant one. In the ceremony of the Israelites, there were certain national feasts that they would keep annually. And the third order of these was the Feast of First Fruits. And it was an annual occasion of consecration for the Israelites, of consecrating, that it was solemnized uh, by uh, solemn, meaning holy, becoming a solemn thing, at the beginning of harvest time. It was the beginning of the harvest time. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, in this Leviticus 23, 9 to 10, it says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you and, and uh, I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest. Bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. So there's a first fruits. Uh, next verse. Is that it? Is that, is that 10? That's all you got. I'm going to have to look that up because I don't think that's, that's all of it. But it is talking about this. It's talking about the, let me just look at it right quick. I didn't proof the thing that might be all of it. It's only got nine. It's supposed to be nine and ten, I think. I got it. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land, which I'm going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in a, the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. That's what it says. And he goes on, he says, he shall wave the sheep before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you've waved the sheep, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old without defect for a burnt offering to the Lord. And though there you see the practice of the Jews foreshadowing the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? John says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's Jesus as an offering for all humanity. And so here we have the harvest offering of, of, of the, the first fruits. And it says, uh, speaks this, it says, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you to reap its harvest. Then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So how does the first fruits have to do with the resurrection? Because Jesus is the first fruits or the first of 
to give us the promise as we look forward that we too shall be raised from the dead. We're not dead. The harvest was divided into three parts. It was one harvest, the fruit of one season, presented on three different occasions. First, there was the sheaf of first fruits, which is the earnest, or like the down payment, the earnest or pledge of a greater harvest that would follow. And it typifies and is a picture of the resurrection of Christ, who by coming forth from the tomb, accomplished the work of redemption and guaranteed for all who believe in him a greater resurrection when he returns. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15 and, and verse 20 says that. In fact, let's just read verse 20 to 23. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So after the first fruits followed the, followed the harvesting of a larger part of the crops. And we read Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. We just read it, verse 23. So our risen Lord is now in heaven, even so. It, it, it goes on, and let's just look at, uh, uh, let's see if I have it on the screen. Well, I'll just skip over that. So my point is, is, is he's, he's, a, he's a perfect example of us knowing because he, wrote, he, he is risen, we too shall rise from the dead. Uh, it says in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ is alive, and he is physically alive. Uh, remember when Jesus, when Thomas doubted, and Jesus appeared to him, and he said, place your hands, your finger in my hands, place, put your hand in my side, feel the holes, feel, see the holes, touch me. And so Jesus was physical. And when we see him, as Pastor Hawkins said, we shall be like him. There will be a physical body there. Now, I don't understand it, but I don't think our physical body being there waits for the physical body here to raise up. Then you read through 1 Corinthians 15, and I believe there's a spiritual body that is different awaiting the literal body that is in the grave to rise up. I think there's some body form that's a temporary body form that's a heavenly type body form that's in heaven because, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And in 15, it talks about different types of bodies. It talks about bodies of fish and bodies of animals and different human flesh and different bodies. And so there's heavenly bodies. He talks about heavenly bodies. And I would say most theologians would agree with me that when you go, when my mom dies, she's not going to be up there like invisible, some spirit or some soul. No, she's going to have a body even though her earthly body is here. And that body will go away when God raises up the other body to be like it was before sin had its way with it. So we recall... So the harvest is not ended yet, okay? It's not complete until the gleanings are added. There are loose ears that fall by the wayside, and these must be gathered up. This is called the gleaning. When, remember Ruth? And she came and she gleaned in the field after the reapers in Ruth 2, 3. The gleanings are those tribulation saints which had not heard the gospel before the rapture of the church. And that's what I mentioned to you. So they are the gleaning. So we have Christ the first fruits. Then we have the harvest of the resurrection of the saved. That's the rapture. And finally, the gleanings after saved, uh, saved during the seven years of tribulation and then going to heaven. And then there's next we see the second res res resurrection. So that's the believer's resurrection in three stages. And we see Christ picturing and promising that in a picture, biblical picture of first fruits. And now we have the second resurrection. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loose for a season, will carry on his rebellion where he left off before the millennium, the thousand year reign was cast, in, and Satan's cast in the bottomless pit with his demons. And then God will have done with Satan forever, for the devil that deceived one, that deceived them and cast, will be cast in a lake of fire. Revelation 20.10 tells us that. It says this, and the, re the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire burn of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night 
forever and ever. If you're throwing something in, you're throwing something that's not just a spirit. You see, I believe that the triune of the devil mentioned here, three, just like he's because he wants to be God and he tries to fake God all the way. So he, you see there's three there. You got the old, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. You got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're physical. They're physical beings. They're thrown in that lake, in that lake of fire. It's a real deal. And then if you pick up in verse 12 in that same chapter, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. In verse 14, the sea gave up the dead that were in it. The death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And when it talks about the dead, it's talking about the dead. They're not alive in Christ. They're not believers. These are the unjust. This is the resurrection. We talked about the resurrection of the just. We're talking about the resurrection of the unjust. And that second resurrection is the resurrection of those that will be judged. And the believers will not be at that great white throne judgment the Bible talks about. That's for those that are damned. And it's already done. It's set. It's not like there's, it, the judgment's going to be meted out. And it's not going to be like where it is here where judges can be fixed or the rich can buy somebody off or somebody can lie their way out of it, mess with the witnesses, intimidate, do anything like that. It doesn't matter who you are. There's a fair and just God that's a judge of all the earth and he knows everything and he will do what is right. And we have to trust him with that. And then there's Acts 7 1931, which says this, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus came the first time as a savior. He'll come the next time as the lover of this world. He'll come the next time as the judge of this world. And Revelation makes that quite clear. Now, Paul preached on the, uh, to the, the sermon to the Athenians on Mars Hill, and he said that God commands all men everywhere to repent because he hath the point of the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness that, by, that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. Acts, it, it, Acts 17, 31. So I want to move on now to the last point, which is a literal physical body. Isaiah mentions it. We quote it in Romans and it's quoted in Romans, and that is this. Isaiah says in verse chapter 45, verse 23, he says this, he says, by myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, sound familiar? By every tongue will swear. By me every tongue will swear. Uh, Paul quotes it in Romans 14, verse 11. He says, it is written, as surely as I live. Notice it is written. He's talking about Isaiah. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge me. And in Philippians 2, 9 to 11, it says this. Therefore God exalted him and given him a name, uh, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and, er and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If this body is not an eternal body, if this body is not physical and literal in heaven, if we're just souls or spirits, then how does the tongue confess? How does the knee bow? How do we, uh, how does all this happen? And I'm, I'm telling you, it is a literal physical body that will rise up from the grave. And again, Revelation 20, 15, it says this, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Thrown into the lake of fire. And not a pretty picture. Now, only part of human race has agreed to this testimony of God the Father, which is given concerning his son. But at the final judgment, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. They will not be able to refuse to bow their knee. They will not be able to refuse to confess it, refuse to confess it. Literal knees, literal tongues, those who had rejected Jesus, who didn't want any part of him, who, who mocked believers, who lived sinful, they were going to confess Jesus as Lord and they're going to bow before him. God finds no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He'd rather save them than for them to die in unbelief. But whosoever is not found written in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. That's the second death. And the last verse is Revelation 21.8. 
But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is a second death. How many of you like, are glad that you get to go to heaven? And it's not because of our denomination. It's not because of perfect or pure doctrine. And I know that, man, I tell you, my body, Pastor Hawkins talking about that, you know, you know I had a similar experience. Someone had given me, given me a senior discount. And I looked at it, I said, you gave me a senior discount. He said, yeah, you're senior, aren't you? I said, I guess I am. You know, the same thing happened to me. It was Culver's, Sandra, it was Culver's. And so, uh, and, and, and so, I mean, yeah, these bodies are going by the wayside, but guess what? My body is gonna live again. People are gonna dance in heaven, they're gonna shout, they're gonna, there's gonna be weeping at a point in time, there's gonna be joy, there's gonna be praise, we're gonna sing, there's gonna be speaking. We're physical, this is not a spirit thing. And it, while it's a mystery, science, and I'm not, I didn't go into that tonight. I think uh, in a couple of weeks I'm preaching on a morning, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more as I, we finish up 1 Corinthians in that message. And it's a design for a morning where, you know, the, the message is a, a powerful salvation and draw people to be right with God. But the thing is, is, is guys, that we, you know, this, physical, this body right here, my DNA, Everything that I am is going there. You know, part of hell is the, is, is the Bible talks about part of hell being the, the, the worm that never dies. That's the memory. You know, you remember times when people said, hey, won't you just accept that Jesus says, Lord, believe it. He died on the cross and accept it. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to change your heart. Make him Lord. Repent of your sins. Turn from yourself and go God's way. Don't go your way. Come. You'll remember that, that you rejected that. You'll remember how easy it was at one point. You'll remember your loved ones, and you'll know that some of them tried to get you, and you'll remember they're not in hell. They're in heaven. You'll know each other in hell, and you'll look over there and see other people that are there with you. The mental torment. You can know how mental torment is. That's part of hell. And I don't want to go there, and I don't want you to go there. I don't believe you're going to go there. With your head bowed and eyes closed, let me just quickly ask, anybody need Jesus to forgive your sin and be your Lord and set your path toward heaven, and you're not sure you're ready and you're going there? Anybody here would like to keep your eyes closed to respect the privacy of your neighbor and say, I just lift my hand quickly, say, I just need Jesus to give me that assurance. I want to go to heaven when I die. Anybody? So here's the deal, guys. If you don't keep that hope, you can get really downtrodden. Because if you look at this world, there's nothing to have joy about. There's trouble everywhere on every hand, and there is. But don't look at that. There's something better awaiting us. We're not citizens of this earth. We're citizens of heaven. There's something better, amen? And you want to have joy. If you want to be sad, sacked, and sorrowful, look at the trouble all around. Read the newspaper. Watch the, everything going on. And then even people you know, all the heartache and dismay, you know? So, so yeah, you know, we can have a, empathy. We can cry for someone. We can be sorry. But look, look, keep your hope that is sure in Jesus know that there's a day awaiting and that there's a home awaiting and this life is short and heaven is real. It's not something you just talk about because somebody dies. It's the real deal and we're going there. Amen? Amen. Amen.